Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hey, all. Welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening and sharing this podcast with friends and other healthcare professionals. Uh, it's certainly greatly appreciated. Uh, if you enjoy the episode today, definitely uh, do us a, a solid and leave us a rating and review on uh, iTunes or, or wherever you're listening. So with that, let's get into the drug I want to talk about today, and that's dicyclamine. The brand name of this medication is Bentol. And in clinical practice, pretty much the only thing I've ever seen this medication used for is uh, GI pain GI spasms most often associated with irritable bowel syndrome, okay? So uh, there may be some off-label wacky use that that somebody uses it for once in a while, but by and large, uh, the overwhelming majority of times you see this medication, uh, it's going to be for uh, IBS and GI cramping and and spasms and, and pain. Uh, it is an anticholinergic agent. Um, so we, we've talked about anticholinergics in, in previous episodes, uh, tricyclic antidepressants, I believe diphenhydramine I've covered. Uh, so all those anticholinergic effects are going to come into play uh, with dicyclamine. So just a reminder, you know, we're blocking the action of acetylcholine in the body, and acetylcholine is important in uh, stimulating gut motility, um, and also plays a role in memory. And depending upon the subtype of receptors, uh, muscarinic receptors that it binds to, uh, there's all sorts of different actions that it can have on uh, various types of smooth muscle. So with dicyclamine specifically, uh, it has been shown um, that it's mostly M1 selective, so muscarinic type 1 selective. Uh, however, as we escalate doses, we have to realize that you know we sometimes lose that selectivity. So uh, at least in, in one article I saw, they, they talked about M1 being specific uh, more so for uh, the GI tract and salivary glands as well as the central nervous system. So those CNS adverse effects, which I'll, I'll cover a little bit further here, um, that that can happen on account of dicyclamine. Um, and then, of course, uh, the GI tract, where we want to have uh, potentially effects and, and kind of slowing that gut down and maybe easing the pain of some of the, the cramping and the spasms. That's where the benefit is ultimately uh, going to potentially come from with this medication. Uh, let's briefly touch on dosing here quick. So, uh, manufacturer does say in its package insert, I believe, that you can use it up to a dose of 40 milligrams four times per day. Uh, I personally don't believe I've ever seen that dose that I recall. And as you get up to those higher doses, you just run the risk of having uh, those anti bothersome anticholinergic adverse effects. So, uh, clinically, the dosing that I've seen most often is usually 20 milligrams four times a day. And most often, I would say I've seen it on a as needed basis. Because if you think about giving a drug uh, that much with that's highly anticholinergic, you could imagine that it's not going to make you potentially feel that great uh, in the long run and potentially have some uh, definitely negative adverse effects. So let's talk about those adverse effects, uh, anticholinergics. So good way to, easy way to remember is can't spit, see, pee, or poop. So uh, spitting, that's dry mouth, and particularly when we talked about that M1 uh, receptor, that's salivary glands. So dry mouth um, may present at a higher rate for day 
cyclamine versus maybe uh, some of the other anticholinergic. Uh, can't see, you know, can exacerbate uh, glaucoma, can uh, cause some, some dry eyes. Uh, P is urinary retention, so that can be problematic. And then poop, uh, the constipation is what anticholinergics can cause there. Now, if you've got a patient with irritable bowel syndrome with predominant diarrhea, obviously a constipating type effect may be a little bit helpful in managing some of those symptoms. Now, if you've got IBS, patient's got pain, cramping, and they've got a lot of constipation, you really got to be careful with using dicyclamine because it's likely going to exacerbate that constipation further. So got to pay attention to that. Got to be really careful, um, you know, with doses and being aggressive and, and that type of thing. Uh, because you could, certainly could um, exacerbate constipation and make it way worse. Uh, other adverse effects, sedation, and then, of course, uh, significant uh, CNS penetration with this drug, so confusion, you know, kind of that mental fogginess, clarity, that, that lack of clarity, that can happen, uh, certainly with the cyclamine. And you know, I think it's one of the reasons why we want to try to limit this medication as much as we can and really target it to only when the patient's having pain, not using it on a chronic long-term basis uh, if we can help it because of some of uh, those adverse effects. So particularly uh, CNS concerns, uh, I've got a big problem in my geriatric patient population uh, with that potentially. Uh, a patient that's, you know, maybe not necessarily firing on all cylinders, maybe they already have some underlying confusion, adding on dicyclamine, you know, for their GI pain or spasms, that's going to uh, potentially worsen that confusion. So we've, we've got to be very, very careful uh, in our geriatric patient population. Uh, follow that geriatric mon mantra, you know, if you absolutely have to use the drug, start low, go slow. Uh, so definitely uh, pay attention to that. Uh, I mean, even in younger patients, you think about, you know, some of the sleepiness, um, maybe some of the, the mental clouding. If you've got a patient that needs to, you know, be very focused at work and, um, you know, they, they need to be very, very sharp in their, their thinking, uh, that, that can be problematic. Again, maybe depends upon the dose, depends upon the patient, um, but definitely something to look at, something to um, ask, ask, and pay attention to. A uh, quick lesson on pharmacokinetics here. So onset of action uh, is approximately one to two hours for dicyclamine. So what that means, you can, you can and absolutely should in certain situations use this on an as-needed basis for pain and cramping. Um, but I think it's important to recognize for the patient, hey, you might not notice that this is helping right away, you know, within the first 15 minutes, within the first 30 minutes, it might take an hour or two for you to really start feeling any benefits. So um, that may, you know, help educate the patient to watch their symptoms a little bit more closely. And if they feel like, you know, symptoms are maybe starting and, and they feel like they're going to escalate, like it's a pattern for them, uh, maybe jumping on that dose uh, right away is something they can learn, just kind of following uh, what their patterns of symptoms are there. Uh, Half-life, as you can expect with a drug that's dosed four times a day, uh, is going to be very, very short. So this is a good thing in the um, onset of adverse effects. So if you've, you know, ex if a patient's experiencing adverse effects, odds are likely they're not going to last you know, five days or, or anything like that typically in most patients because uh, that duration of action, uh, half-life is uh, generally shorter, you know, in the ballpark of uh, two to four hours with this medication. So let's take a quick break from our sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Uh, go check out the resources there. Uh, my audible book of uh, drug interactions in primary care is now available. So I'm going to be putting uh, that link uh, on the meded101.com slash store page. So you can check that out under the Audible books. Uh, if you've never had an Audible book, you can get your first one for free. 
So that's a, a pretty cool thing, and it, it is a, uh, a large book <laughs> that uh, took me a while to, to make, and it's over 10 hours of clinical content on drug interactions, case studies, uh, things you see out in clinical practice. Uh, of course, if you're a pharmacist, uh, pharmacy student, NAPLEX, BCPS, uh, geriatrics, ambulatory care, uh, BCMTMS study materials as well, go check that out. Uh, also got hard copies, ebooks on Amazon. There's links there as well. So meded101.com slash store. Uh, support the sponsor there and uh, help support this podcast. Keep it free and educational for all to enjoy. So talking about my drug interaction book, let's get into drug interactions with dicyclamine. Uh, by far, the biggest thing I'm going to look at and I'm going to worry about is anticholinergic burden. So if you've got a patient that you know is taking medications for sleep, definitely get to the bottom of it, bottom of it see what medications they're taking, uh, recognize if it's an anticholinergic med. So uh, diphenhydramine, uh, doxylamine, uh, if they say they're taking you know, any type, any type of cough and cold preparation, that's a nighttime preparation, odds are likely it's going to have an anticholinergic medication in it. So that can have additive effects on top of what dicyclamine can do. So very, very important to, to keep that in mind. We've also got plenty of prescription drugs with anticholinergic effects. Uh, hydroxazine, uh, tricyclics I've covered. Uh, you can go listen to, to that podcast. Uh, oxybutynin, you know, an older um, uh, medication used for urinary frequency, incontinence, that type of thing. Uh, so definitely keep tabs uh, on that medication list or ask your uh, friendly clinical pharmacist if you have one in your practice or wherever you work uh, to help you out. Take a peek at the, the med list and make sure we're not uh, doubling up on some of those adverse effect profiles there. Uh, additive effects, I mentioned kind of sedation. Um, that can happen with dicyclamine, so any drug that can be sedating, uh, that can be um, additive in nature. Uh, constipation certainly can happen with this medication. Same thing with dry mouth. Think of those additive effects. Um, you know, drugs like clonidine, trazodone are a couple that come to mind that can cause dry mouth in addition to other anticholinergics. Uh, constipation, so, you know, drugs like opioids could add on to the that adverse effect. Um, and then I, I did want to make specific mention of uh, some of the inhaled anticholinergics. So certainly we can have some additive effects, particularly with, um, you know, dry mouth is probably going to be the, the most common one there. Most of the inhaled anticholinergics used in COPD don't have a lot of systemic absorption and systemic effects. So we generally don't need to worry about that too much. Um, but it is certainly something to to pay attention to if you know a patient's taking a lot of ipratropium along with frequent dicyclamine. Um, definitely uh, keep an eye out for that. And you're probably most likely going to run into dry mouth first and foremost um, before maybe some of those other adverse effects, other anticholinergic adverse effects. So I think that's going to sum it up today. Go sign up, reallifepharmacology.com. I send out emails when we got a new podcast available, so you can keep tabs on that. You also get a free 31-page PDF of the top 200 drugs, and I lay out my most important clinical pearls with those drugs. So really unique resource, great resource for you know pharmacy students, med students, nursing students, uh, young healthcare professionals in general. Go take advantage of that. And then uh, if you have time, like I mentioned early in the podcast, leave us a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. And of course, share us. Uh, send out an email to, to classmates, to students that, you know, maybe you're precepting, for example. Um, if you enjoy the podcast, share it with them. Help them pick up some clinical pearls, uh, be better at medication management, and ultimately uh, help all of our patients. So I'm going to sign off for today. Track me down on LinkedIn. Uh, Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCGP, BCPS. You can also uh, send me an email at reallifepharmacology.com. Hit the contact button and you can track me down there. Thanks for listening. Take care. Have a great rest of your day.
Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.